I know I kind of brought this up last time, but I feel like it needs to be emphasized. I really appreciate how the creators of this franchise have taken the criticisms of their fandom and learned from them. In particular, the head writer, Akifumi Kaneko. While I can't seem to find a picture of the dude, just going by the fact that he turned 49 this year tells me he's in for the long haul. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised by his age considering he's also been working on the Wild Arms franchise since 1996, but to be able to keep a fairly level head through these many years and productions more than deserves to be commended. And based on interviews with him, Kaneko seems to be a really humble guy, as well as have some really good taste, more on that later. But yeah, after a year where I've had to sit through many disappointing productions, of which I think many creators should learn how to listen to their audience more, I'm just glad that we can still get honest works like Sinful Gear to help us through the noise of it all. Okay, got my gripes with Hollywood out, for now. So let's move on to the second half of Sinful Gear GX. with Maria recollecting her less than graceful performance in the previous season. And to her credit, she did want to overcome her weaknesses, and thanks to Elf-9, she would be able to do that using her sister's fully repaired gear. Obviously, Elf-9 also modded it to work with Maria and incorporate the Ignite module. She did the same for Kika and Shiabe, and with that, our heroines were going to start training to master their fancy new equipment by... Oi, Maria! I legit got nothing! The joke's right there on your screen! Seriously, I just can't believe how straightforward they try to play this up through Gendro's narration. I mean, I get that they would need a cooldown episode after their intense fight with Carol and everything, so I'm not necessarily against this, but come on guys, just come on and say you want to do a fanservice episode, you don't see Evangelion trying to hide it. Anyway, while our heroines were hard at work with their training, Song was looking at, um, Vector Sigma? Ah, sweet. I've been meaning to add the G1 Stunticons to my collection. No, actually, it was something they had recreated from the data found with Nastasha on the frontier. They called it the Photosphere. Photosphere to a itai. Oh, I don't know, it's just a spherical object with shapes that kind of resemble Africa and Eurasia, but I'm sure it has nothing to do with anything. Elf-9 also tried to participate in the training, both for the sake of some lowly fan service and to set up some decent character development later. Though first, they needed to get some refreshments. Thus, they all played a round of rock-paper-scissors to see who would go and hey, no guns, Spasa! Because of that little cheat, she ended up going with Kika and Shabe to the convenience store. I think the more proper term is waifu. On their way back, they encountered the signs of a disaster. Oh, I'm not talking about the icicles. Urge to kill, rising. But yeah, Garye soon arrived. Hibiki and Chris tried to deal with her, but her main target was Maria. Thus, while the two dealt with the Alkanoids, Maria once again donned Serena's gear. Man, I gotta say, I think Maria has my second favorite gear in this franchise after Chris. While her blades aren't as flashy as Tsubasa's, she more than makes up for it through sheer practicality, being able to use them both as melee and homing projectiles. However, there's a reason Ivy Valentine isn't recommended for beginners. Still adjusting to her new gear, Maria had no choice but to give the Ignite module a shot with less than desirable results. A full berserker Maria was easily outwitted by Garye, who once again decided to just rage quit when her opponent failed to live up to her expectations. Later, our heroines regrouped to discuss why their enemies were pulling such hit-and-run tactics. Oh, give it time, girls. I'm sure you won't be disappointed by the answer. Meanwhile, to clear her head a little, Maria tried to help Elf-9 with her volleyball game. Through it, she ended up asking the little alchemist what her definition of strength was. But before she could finish her sentence, Garye conveniently came back for round two. The rest of the gear users went to provide backup, giving Farah an opportunity to sneak in. It's the wind! The wind! The wind! 
Ogawa, did you just not drink your coffee this morning? Back to the fight, Maria started to realize what Elf Nine meant. Trying to act strong got her nowhere last season, and still wasn't doing her any favors now. True strength comes from focusing on your own abilities and being true to them. Kind of pointless fan service aside, this episode was really good for Maria as it managed to fix her character from the inconsistent whiner from the previous season. Thus, with her new techno-based powers, Maria managed to make quick work of the auto score, but in defeat, Garye seemed kind of happy for some reason. On top of that, Farm managed to steal the data on the photosphere, however, all of that was small potatoes compared to the arrival of a certain... Oh, what's the word? Get me. As while Miki and I ran to the convenience store, the clerk there recognized Miku and Hibiki. <laughs> I'm cool. I do not care for Akira Tachibana. He had actually been mentioned earlier this season as having left his family after the events of the very first episode that led to Hibiki becoming ostracized by everyone. So yeah, he abandoned his wife and kid through what was one of the most difficult times in their lives. As if being voiced by the scumbag tuner god wasn't bad enough. And yes, I know what he does in Season 5, but that doesn't change how I feel about him in this season. Regardless, Hibiki did try to meet him halfway when he asked if he could re-enter the family, by first having Hibiki talk to her mother for him. Yeah, understandably, she refused his request, but on top of everything else... He's an asshole. Quite frankly, I usually wouldn't mind so much if a character like this was a tall prick, but it's what they do with him later that really ticks me off. For now though, let's just go back to something good. You two are the best kind of aspirin. The two were called in to take care of some alkanoids attacking some underground tunnels. However, Hibiki was also called in and wasn't in the best of moods. <laughs> As a result, Mika, who had been leading the attack, managed to land a lucky shot on her and eventually took out all three. She then retreated, having accomplished her primary mission. Basically, after having destroyed the power plants back in episode 5, they were trying to track where all the remaining electricity in the country was being priority routed. And considering what they end up looking for, it kind of becomes more than a bit of a convoluted plan. Then again, this is a plan that also involves the absurdity of the ley line, so maybe that should be expected. Back with our heroines, everyone was playing the blame game. Kik and Shabi were dueling it out with each other, while Hibiki blamed herself and her daddy issues. Let me guess, you saw what came after, Deno. But yeah, again, I'm just not a fan of these moping scenes as they tend to really slow down the show's pace. Kik and Shabi stuff at least tied into their character arcs for this season, but yet they keep having Hibiki re-enter these angst phases that she should have overcome by the end of season 2. And considering who's the cause of it all, it's more than a bit infuriating. Anyway, following the pattern they started in the last episode, the auto score returned to fight a round 2 with the gear users she defeated. During the fight, Kika and Shabi again quarreled, but this time they reveal why they were frustrated with each other. No, no, it's okay, let him work it out. But yeah, this is actually a really good scene, as the two were able to finally acknowledge how their teammates cared for them through their tough love and how they were doing the same for each other. And realizing how they were being pushed to be better, they decided to answer those expectations. With her opponents releasing their full powers, Mika did likewise by losing her cute giant pigtails. Boo! Still, with all parties going in full force, I'd honestly call this one of the best fights of the season, especially thanks to the ending with Kika and Shabi working in tandem to sandwich the auto score between their finishers. Nice. With that, another doll was taken out, but they also did go against Gendro's direct orders and were appropriately reprimanded. Thus, the two also learned that their actions had consequences, which of course also applied to what they did in the previous season. <laughs> 
While this season's plot has many structural problems, its individual scenes like these are fantastic. Back with the remaining Oscorers, while they did just lose the strongest among them, they also did regain their leader. Yeah, apparently Carol pulled a Tokuazaki and just so happened to have an extra body lying around to transfer her memories into. Those same memories that she was using to fuel her operations, so what sort of memories was she burning and yet could still remember her master plan? Well, no time to think about that, as big plot twist, there was a mole among Song's ranks. Yeah, more on that later. Going into episode 9, we move on to a Tsubasa focused episode. Well, okay, she hasn't got a whole lot of screen time this season, but I'm sure she'll be able to go through an interesting and unique little arc, and oh crap, I just remember what happened in episode 6. Yes, as it turns out, Tsubasa also had daddy issues. Also, hi President Kaisma, how many more Blade themed magical girls are you gonna work with? Anyway, the reason they were there was to protect a keystone at her family's mansion that was supposedly regulating the ley lines. Other stones had already been destroyed at shrines throughout the country in the last episode. If all that exposition dump feels like it's coming out of nowhere, it's only because it is. And yet, all of those plot points weren't quite as awkward as Tsubasa's family life as her father seemed to ignore her for the most part. Nice way of introducing yourself to your future father-in-law, Maria. To break the tension a little, we got the arrival of our Monster of the Week, I mean, Farah, who, yeah, you can guess the pattern at this point. She defeats a gear user to set up a comeback for later with their Ignite form. I mean, yes, this is all playing into something for a little later, but it doesn't stop it from being rather monotonous. Anyway, Farah succeeded in destroying the Keystone and took five. Meanwhile, Carol and Leia were infiltrating a secret underwater facility that they had found through their hacking of the power systems in the last episode. Again, kinda feels like they went with a very convoluted way of doing things. I mean, all they would really have to do is look at a power routing map, and I think an underwater base would kind of stick out. Anyway, a team led by Chris went in to deal with them. And they would have to hurry as Elf Knight had figured out they were after... Yeah, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that. Basically, it was a key to activate her little doomsday device. We'll get back to them in just a minute. For now, we check back with Tsubasa and her very complicated family issues. After yet another tense talk with her dad, we did at least get a cute scene in which Maria saw Tsubasa's sloppy living habits for the first time. Also, based on how much her voice actress now in Mizuki loves Enka, I can't help but feel like this is based off of her real life room. I mean, maybe, maybe not. But yeah, for Tsubasa, she gained her love of music through her father even though they never had the strongest relationship. And that was, unfortunately, all because of her grandfather, the far to both her dad and Gendro. As it turned out, he didn't choose either of his sons to become the heir of his family, but instead his supposed granddaughter. I say supposed because... I mean... Wow, that was just a really gross turn. I mean, just to put in perspective, that would mean that Gendro and Yatsunori are her half-brothers, and this old geezer did with his son's wife. No wonder things are awkward between these two. He got turned into the biggest cuckold by his father's hundred-year-old package. And no, I'm not exaggerating, that's a part of his official bio. I get the feeling like they threw this really dark turn in just to distinguish it from Hibiki's plotline. And while I'll admit I like it better as we'll soon see Mr. Brother Dad isn't a tall putz like Akira, it's still... ill. Anyway, Far arrived just on time for her scheduled round 2. Since her weaponry was specifically designed to destroy blades, Tsubasa was at a massive disadvantage. However, Yatsunori soon arrived, and for once, acted like a real father, or brother, depending on how you want to interpret it. Jokes aside, and while I'm still legit grossed out by this plotline, I do like the relationship between these two. Now, of course things would be more than a little awkward between the two, but regardless, he still raised Tsubasa as his daughter, so some part of him would develop fatherly instincts, including wanting to preserve the precious time he spent with her. It's by no means a great storyline, wait a couple seasons for that, but I'll take what I can get if only to get rid of some of the ickiness of it all. So yeah, Night Form and Tsubasa finally managed to defeat her mannequin rival. Back with Chris's team, they managed to corner Carol, but... 
Oh, Brady, chew up my scenery. Excuse me, I got gore in you one. But yeah, along with a ton of dangerous and powerful artifacts, someone got the bright idea to imprison the genocidal mad scientist right next to all that stuff. The reason for this being because the higher-ups wanted to cover up the Frontier incident by not formally arresting Ver and just treated him as a part of the Nephilim. Because yeah, just hiding all of your problems works out great every time, don't it, Uncle Sam? I'm the government. I'm the government. I'm the reason nothing works. I think Kika and Shabe best sum it up. Understandably, Chris wanted to knock Ver's block off for what she went through in the previous season, but... Yeah, I'm signing you two up for rehab. The villains managed to work together to escape, not helped by the fact that Chris lost her cool trying to live up to the expectations of her new juniors, even ending up pushing them away. I'll say right now, of the OG heroines of this franchise, Chris probably got the best character arc of the season, and not just because it's Chris, though that doesn't hurt. In the previous season, she was the junior to Tsubasa, and while she was kind of lax about it at first, she did eventually put in the effort to live up to her expectations. And now in this season, having seen how much Tsubasa agonized over it, the sense of responsibility transferred to her. Combine that with her lingering PTSD, and you have the makings of a very potent angst cocktail. A good kind of angst, as unlike her teammates, it does the job of fleshing out and advancing her character in new and interesting ways that relate back to previous storylines, but don't totally rehash them. Bottom line, Aihi Takagaki should have totally been a pre-cure this season, and not just a mother. No, I'm never going to get over that. Meanwhile, Tsubasa and Maria began to interrogate their mutilated enemy. With her mission pretty much accomplished, she revealed her master's evil plans just as her master was doing likewise to the song crew. Yeah, even though she should be focused on running away from Chris's team, she just took the time to project herself in front of them in order to explain how... My plan is great! And even though it didn't benefit her in any way and might have been detrimental to her plans, she revealed that she had been using Elf-9 to spy on them and evade their pursuers. Just ignoring the fact that you can't really do that if you're not moving and wasting your time with your evil gloating there, Carol. Oh, but no, this little exposition dump took priority. And as you might have guessed, they were supposed to lose to our protagonist in order to collect the energy given off by the Ignite modules. So, let me get this straight, Carol. You purposely let one of your clones escape in the hopes that you would give your enemies new powers and that your enemies would use those new powers to defeat your dolls in order to power up your doomsday machine. Putting aside the fact that it sounds like something right out of Aizen's convoluted playbook, let me just poke a small hole in all that. Why exactly attack the generators back in episode 5? I'm not talking about the generators across the country, as they already kind of explained that. I'm talking specifically about Song's generators. At that time, Elf-9 hadn't finished the Ignite modules and might not have been able to if the power was taken out. More importantly, Hibiki was still recovering at that time. For all Carol knew, she might have ended up cutting off her life support and boom, you're down one of your strongest batteries for your little doomsday device. She had no way of knowing that Kika and Shabi were going to come out to stop her. As far as Elf-9 knew, they were undeployable. So what pray tell was she going to do? Destroy the generators and possibly jeopardize her own plans? Or just stand there and do nothing the whole time? It just don't add up! Again, while I do appreciate Akifumi Kanako's enthusiasm for writing, I also think he lacks a lot of foresight and focuses too much on these set pieces, which are cool and everything, but for this season, it's causing the plot to fall in on itself, especially in these final few episodes. Anyway, what does Song do to Elf-9 after learning all of this, and the girl herself even begs to be thrown into the brig? What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Look, I'm not necessarily saying what they're doing is morally wrong, but you'd think they would at least hesitate a little. I mean, y'all do realize that she could still be a sleeper agent, and more to the point, you really should be caring more about whether or not your enemy knows your every move. This whole scene feels like it was meant to be a dramatic set piece for Elf-9, but you know, rather than trying to play up the feels, maybe writers should first write these characters in ways that actually make sense. 
It's honestly amazing. This one episode has both some of the best writing of the franchise with the Chris stuff, but also some of the worst with the Carol and Elf 9 stuff. I just, it frustrates me more than anything else. Anyway, no surprise, Chris's team caught up with them, and before anyone comments, yes, I know that Lair was supposed to be the final auto score to be defeated so that Carol could collect the Ignite module power, but why would she and Ver need to stick around? They could clearly teleport out any time they wanted, so why didn't they? In any case, Leia managed to take down the trio, even smashing Kiyuk and Shabe between a couple of giant coins. Okay, maybe I spoke too soon when I said Mika was the cartoonish auto score. And Chris's worries became a self fulfilling prophecy, or so it seemed. <laughs> Thus, Chris used her ignite module and a new attack in which she pistol, or rather, rifle whipped her opponent. <laughs> okay, this is an incredibly dumb sequence, but I'll give it a pass for making me laugh a little. Together, Chris and her juniors managed to defeat the last all score without blowing themselves up. However, even when Laird defeated her little sister was still around. Well, still better than Uprising. After such an epic and thrilling cliffhanger, episode 11 opened with... Song managing to escape destruction, and Chris one-shotting the kaiju. DISAPPOINTED! Inside, Elf Nine managed to protect one of the bridge crew while injuring herself in the process. Okay, here's another reason why I think they forgave Elf Nine way too quickly in the last episode. Imagine this scene, but Elf Nine is in handcuffs. The crew would begrudgingly comply with her request of detaining her, and yet, in spite of her guilt and things obviously being awkward between them, she still would decide to protect the crew member because she still wanted to do the right thing. <laughs> Boom, you give Elf Nine a much more character defying moment, having come back from the brink of despair instead of already giving her validation. But hey, let's not worry about missed opportunities, and instead just switch over to this. Sad sack, damn it. Yeah, unfortunately, we're still continuing this subplot, though at least Hibiki told her father to get off his ass and try to reconcile with his wife on his own. You suck! She rightfully decided to drop this deadbeat, and thankfully, she didn't have to pay for lunch this time, as an evil Laputa was descending from the skies. With help from Ver, Carol managed to activate her chateau. In doing so, the villains began discussing motivations. Dr. Ver obviously still wanted to become the literal last action hero, while Carol, having misconstrued her father's last words, temporarily became a more interesting villain. I kind of joked about it last time, but now I'm really starting to wish we had gotten this Yandere Shiel. One thing's for sure, she would be a lot more interesting than this buzzkill, who immediately after revealed she had no plans after attaining ultimate knowledge. Thus, as much as I hate to admit it, I agree with most of what Dr. Ver said here, that basically Carol's pursuits were completely pointless without any real end goal. Also, his arguments were somewhat boosted by Sugita's amazing ad-libbing. Huh. Uh. Yeah. But yeah, when you have two villains who can't agree on their hypocritical ideals, things tend to break down. On the ground level, Hibiki was trying to evacuate everyone while her father... Good thing I have more than one of these clips. What an asshole! Oh, but does it get worse from there, as Carol soon arrived to confront Hibiki and her top dad. And we got the scene I've dreaded talking about throughout this review. After Carol knocked Hibiki's relic out of her hand, Akia seemingly tried to make a run for it. Now, if he actually did run away here, that alone would be irritating to see, but you know, at least it would fit with this unlikable character they've established. Unfortunately, it's what they do here instead that really grinds my gears. Yes, now of all times they try to redeem Akira. A character who I remind you in 
all of his appearances so far has been a petty deadbeat coward who not just a few minutes earlier tried to profit off a disaster while his daughter was frantically trying to help people, and now all of a sudden we're supposed to forgive all of that and even kind of respect the guy who originally gave Hibiki her catchphrase. <laughs> This just does not sit well with me on so many different levels, but for now, let's try and look at the more objectively disagreeable elements here. Up until this point in the season, have we seen any sort of redeeming qualities out of this character? Well, no, and that was kind of by design. I mean, what part of making his daughter pay for lunch was supposed to endear us to this character? If you're going to have your character act like a scumbag for much of his runtime, then follow through with it. Here, it feels like it's a really bad case of them trying to have their cake and eat it too. This isn't like, say, Jerry Smith, who while sharing a lot of unlikable traits with this guy, we actually got to know Jerry. We saw a man who we were supposed to not like for the most part, but at times could still pity him as even he knew how pathetic he was. Therefore, when he had his brief moments of manning up, we could actually get behind him. Akira, up until this episode, has only made a couple of sparse appearances across two episodes, exhibiting nothing beyond his deadbeat old man characteristics. Maybe if we had actually got to see little bits of him here and there doing stuff like actually regretting leaving his family and not just asking his daughter to fix things for him, then maybe this scene wouldn't feel so out of the blue and have some actual weight to it. Just a minute ago, I pointed out how ridiculously quickly they defeated Lair's sister as if they just wanted to drop that plotline as quickly as possible. Well, really, that can apply to these last three episodes in general. It just feels like they had so many different ideas, but ran out of time to fully develop them, which, now that I think about it, seems to be a common problem with a lot of modern magical girl anime I review. Anyway, Hibiki got her second win and punched the evil Loli hard in the gut, though unfortunately, Akira was rescued by her arriving teammates. <laughs> Kira, just like Kruse die, you know you wanna. Carol once again activated her super mode, which for some reason Maria called it the burst mode. Nah, yeah, I'm just gonna assume she's a fan of savers. Also, fun fact, according to an interview with Kaneko, he said that this form was supposed to be a callback to Showa era magical girl anime, most notably Minky Momo, in which the titular protagonist used her magic to turn into an older alter ego. So basically they're just setting it up so that Showa era S magical girl is fighting these modern Heisei era girls. So you see, it's not about fetish fuel or anything like that. Please don't call the FBI on me again. Well, thankfully, we could somewhat ignore that, as finally they let Inori Minase sing, and oh boy, was it worth the wait. While I can't play it, obviously for copyright reasons, let's just say it's a theme worthy of a final boss. On top of that, thanks to her fancy harp, Carol was able to freely use a swan song with no recoil effect. Left with no other options, the team split up with the original trio distracting Carol while Marie and Cole infiltrated the chateau. Inside the flying castle, they found a 17 year old. Yeah, obviously this wasn't the real Nastasia as they had already given her a proper funeral, but rather was an illusion created by the chateau. Still, illusion or not, when the boss is giving you a dressing down based on your past sins, it's hard not to be taken down a few notches. Meanwhile, outside, Carol was giving the original trio an exposition dump on the origins of alchemy in this universe. It's honestly pretty interesting world building that I really wish wasn't just stuffed into this penultimate episode of the season, as it even tied back to Fine's origins. But then I guess it would get in the way of other storylines that took priority. Back inside the chateau, Marie and Cole managed to find an injured but still alive Ver who agreed to help shut it down. They protected him against the control room security system, which Carol took notice of. What, you thought a little fall like that was going to take him out? Clearly you haven't partaken in Conical's other works. However, the chateau's last defenses soon arrived and took on a more familiar form. Oh come on, I already made the hard catch references last time. However, since this has 
pretty much been the season for the former FIS, they managed to hold their own, even having enough time to exchange some nice words with their counterparts in the original trio. And with some additional help from an injured Elf-9, the Doc managed to shut down and reverse the Chateau's effects. In a last ditch effort, the defenses tried to play directly to Maria's emotions, but really all that accomplished was give her an opportunity to bring out the ham again. They succeeded, but Carol managed to shoot them down. Still, with her plans having fallen apart on her, Carol herself started to break down. Her clone tried to remind her of their father's last wishes, which Akira also tried to help remind her, because again, this guy totally earned this moment. Okay, sorry, I already did my rant, so let's just move on. Her words ultimately didn't reach her because, quite frankly, I think these were her true goals from the very beginning. With the intent of burning up the remainder of her memories, Carol went all out. To counter this, the gear users tapped their pendants twice to unleash even more power. Wait, what? When did these things basically become Kamen Rider toys? Oh right, from pretty much the start of the season. Yeah, more on that when we get to the closing thoughts. Regardless of all of that, and even a full-on safety release, it didn't hold up to Carol's power-scaling BS. <laughs> Things look bad, but to, really, no one's surprised, Marie and crew were fine and were there to save the day. What was surprising was the fact that it was all thanks to Dr. Verd diverting the castle's debris away from them and more towards him. Because while he was unquestionably a monster, he was also a monster who wholeheartedly believed in his accomplishments and therefore needed someone to expound his tales. Honestly, this was mostly a really effective send-off for the guy, except for... I this. Because when all else fails, turn to the meme, son! <sighs> Just one more episode. Anyway, you know the drill by this point. X-Drive forms came out as we entered into the final episode. And thankfully, it was pretty damn epic, especially when we don't have to deal with eye-rolling power scalings and just have some fun mook-clearing action. I especially love Kika and Shabe's yo-yo of death. I mean, it looked absolutely ridiculous, especially when Kika was controlling it with what looked like a joystick, but whatever, it's a giant yo-yo of death. I'll let it pass. And at the very least, it was more subtle than this. However, even the power of lesbians couldn't stop Carol from going one-winged angel. We're all going to hell, aren't we? Using power from her teammates, Hibiki got herself a big bang punch, and he defeated Carol, thankfully with no last-minute betrayals in sight, and Oni with minimal property damage. Though, while it seemed like Hibiki and the memory of her father rescued her, Carol disappeared soon after. She did eventually return, going to Elf Nine's bedside, but with amnesia having burned all of her memories. Kaneko, did you just really want to work on Persona or something? With the body of one falling apart and the mind of another fading, the two found a little compromise. Thus, the season ended with the gear users once again trying to go back to their normal lives, Song getting a lot of new crew along with Elf Carol, and Hibiki's mom getting probably the most tragic ending of everyone here. Seriously, look at that face. It just says, Hibiki, what are you dragging me into, honey? While I know I sounded really negative for the second half of the season, I'm honestly more conflicted than anything else, because I do think this season has both some of the best and worst writing of the entire franchise. What did work for me was pretty much everything carried over from G, and yes, that included this guy. But yeah, to me, the characters introduced in G really stole the show. All of them got significant development, and thus somewhat justified their more off-putting aspects from the last season. Kika remained the likable little goober she was, but now was actually thinking for herself and not relying so much on others like Shiabe. Yeah, she was still clingy, but at least not annoyingly so, and even at one point tried to defeat one of the autoscores on her own. Shabe likely noticed this, but couldn't bring herself to address that first due to her introverted tendencies. Those did eventually fade away, and not only was she able to admit to her mistakes back in G, 
but in some ways might have been in need of guidance even more so than Kika. And ultimately, through their teamwork, they were able to support each other in a much healthier fashion, Linker notwithstanding. Having been relieved of the pressures of becoming a terrorist who would protect the world from destruction, Maria spent this season trying to find the strength and fortitude she lacked in the previous season. It wasn't going to be an easy task due to her lingering insecurities, but interacting with her new team helped her through that. Stuff like becoming the coach to Elf 9, or becoming the straight man to Tsubasa and her family issues, yeah, we'll get to that. But thanks to her interactions with her and Hibiki, she was able to take on more of a mentor role, which she was more suited for than just a blind follower. Then again, considering most of her non-song higher-ups were either insane or incompetent, maybe that wasn't entirely her fault. Regardless, it was nice to see her become far more assertive and finally overcome the wounds of her past, be it her sister or even a certain walking meme. Speaking of whom, who would have ever thought that this dude would take a chill pill? I mean, yeah, he still brought more ham than my relatives at last Thanksgiving, but with his reduced role, he was a lot more tolerable, and even had a chance to show off how committed he was to his routine. His speech to Carol was one of the great ones from an otherwise two-dimensional villain. Sure, he still wasn't the best anime antagonist ever, but hey, at least he went out on a semi-good note. Actually, I think GX is an interesting little inversion of G, as while I thought that they dropped the ball with developing the former FIS in that season, but still did the original trio great, I think this season... yeah... Though, Chris is a bit of an outlier because, well, it's Chris. Then again, it also helped that her stuff was intertwined with Kika and Shabe, with both parties trying to live up to the expectations of the other, leading into some very engaging internal conflicts. It also provided us with another part to Chris's surprisingly consistent arc. She started off the series as a rebellious teen trying to go against the system, only to realize she was just causing more trouble for everyone else. In G, she was like a young adult entering into the workforce and learning how to respect her seniors. And in this season, she became a full adult and now had to recreate the learning experiences she once took for granted. I know it sounds like I'm just being a Chris fanboy, but I really do appreciate how her arc throughout this entire franchise has had no major flaws, at least in comparison to her teammates. Tsubasa was by no means bad this season, but she also didn't have much to do either. And really, I don't think she needed to do that much this season, as there was already a lot going on, and she already got her fair share of development in previous seasons. In fact, I kind of wish we got a little less of her, if only so that we could avoid the Kazunari family subplot. I mean, I get that they want to build towards future plot lines, but A, we already have two girls with daddy issues, yeah, we'll get to them in just a bit, and B, it's a hell of a bombshell to drop in the middle of the season knowing that they wouldn't be able to conclude it just yet. And that conveniently leads into my biggest problem with this season, the plot is very very overbloated. And unfortunately, a lot of it centers around our main protagonist. I know that Hibiki can be a base-breaking character, but even now, I still really like her, even though I can recognize why people might not, and I think a lot of that comes from this season. For whatever reason, they gave her two depression arcs in this one season. Now, while I'm personally not a fan of depressed superheroes, I think these arcs can be done right if they're given time. But to try and tackle two back-to-back -back in 13 episodes is just insane. And yes, while they were somewhat connected, I do still consider them two separate arcs since we did kind of get two rising from the ashes scenes, which, you know, when you do it twice in one season, it kind of loses its impact. Really, if they had to do one, they should have just have stuck with the latter Akira arc, especially considering how it tied to Carol's dad. However, as I went over, this was one of the many undercooked plot lines of the season. Others included Maria becoming a puppet to the UN, Leia's little sister, and unfortunately, a lot of Carol stuff. As I just mentioned, Hibiki and Carol kind of paralleled each other through their father plot lines. Again, this is actually an interesting idea. Have the main protagonist and antagonist share similar issues with trying to honor the words of their fathers. Hibiki had a hard time living up to Akira's words because of her low opinion of the man. Meanwhile, Carol may have held her father in too high regards, and as a result, was filled with malice towards the world that took him away from her. 
Thus, ironically, she probably ended up doing the exact opposite of what Isaac would have ever wanted her to do. On paper, this is really interesting stuff, but in execution... Yeah. I already went over my problems with the Akira stuff, and while Carol had one of the more interesting villain motivations of this franchise, as a character, they didn't really develop her quite enough in spite of having a really interesting gimmick that only really came up near the very end, her memory-fueled powers. I mean, just imagine if Carol started off as the usual OTT Sinful Gear villain, but as time went on and she burned more of her memories, she would become more of the cynical nihilist. We could still see her as this relentless villain, but we could also feel a little sorry for her as her mental stability would slowly begin to deteriorate. But again, they just had so much else going on that I guess they couldn't focus on that. Well, at least the auto scores were pretty fun mid bosses, seeming to play up common shoujo manga tropes to the nth degree. And even though in the latter half of the season they were essentially reduced down to just monsters of the week a la Precure, they left a strong enough impression that people wanted to see them return in more than one form. With all that said, would I say overall I dislike this show? No, it's still simple gear. There's plenty to like, in spite of my many handcuffs with this particular season. Both the animation and music continue to improve, with Inori Minase becoming a fantastic addition to the soundtrack. When they weren't trying to reinvent the wheel, they managed to greatly build off otherwise highly underutilized or underdeveloped characters. And, more than anything else, you can tell this franchise was made by people who actually cared. Along with that Showa vs. Hazy Magical Girls motif I mentioned, they also brought in some less overt common Rider references, with the Ignite forms referencing how Rider powers often come from the same sources as their respective antagonists. Little stuff like that make you realize that this was made by people who understand their fan bases. Moreover, if they didn't care, they wouldn't have heeded the criticisms from their viewers. The overwhelmingly bad response Akira generated convinced the creators to leave out the fathers for almost all of the next season, only bringing them back the following season after things had cooled down. That stuff will be saved for discussions for another day and won't really affect my opinion of this season by itself, but I do appreciate when creators listen. Take note, Hollywood. But yeah, for me, Sinful Gear is at its best when it's mostly just plain dumb fun like this. They can try to incorporate a little story to keep things fresh, but for this season, I think they tried to do a little too much and a lot of it didn't land. However, since they did do a lot this season, it freed up the preceding two seasons, allowing them to do a lot more, which in the long term, I'd say paid off. So in the end, I guess I would view GX as mostly just a transitional season. Sure, it did have its own good moments, but did end up becoming more of a stepping stone for much greater stuff later. And for that, I can't really hate it. Thanks for checking out this year's Simple Gear review, which I really wasn't planning on releasing around Christmas time again, it just kind of worked out that way. Regardless, I'll try and see if I can get to access before December 2020. Here's looking forward to a new year of reviews, and until then, no farewell for now, my friends, and if you'll excuse me, I gotta start organizing my memes.